everyone and welcome to Shelby This Week. Our top news stories, drilling stops, but for how long, where gas prices come from, and it's back to school time. All this, plus much more, but first. The drill at 25 and Dequinder has stopped indefinitely. The noise, bright lights, and other bothersome tendencies have come to a halt after West Bay Exploration has stated their goal is to be a good partner in the community. Katie Shimatero updates us on this drilling story. Shelby Township residents and its Board of Trustees have bought themselves a little more time to get state legislation involved and help shut down this oil drilling site for good. West Bay Exploration agreed earlier this week that they will cease drilling operations at 25 and Dequinder starting today. It is a small temporary victory for Shelby residents, but the shutdown is not permanent and could start up again in the near future. I just want to see this indefinite become permanent. And I, I think that if, you know, the residents of Shelby Township and the Board of Trustees, if we continue to stand up for what we believe is right and not having this drilling, um, I, I think we'll be very successful. Shelby Township's Board of Trustees have done all they can to support the initiative to stop residential drilling. Luckily, the state has stepped in to temporarily shut down drilling operations, and the state is pushing for a new bill to permanently end all residential oil drilling. We're very happy that Governor Snyder and also uh, Senator Jack Brandenburg and Representative Pete Lund have stepped in to really bring this small victory, uh, well, it's a big victory, um, about. And if it weren't for them, uh, we would probably still be having some big problems of, of trying to stop that, that um, exploration of oil and gas. But citizens against oil drilling say that's not enough. Residents have to get involved and help put an end to this immediately. We don't believe as citizens, as neighbors, that our rights are protected by the state or even by our local government. And so we formed this group. We're looking to add others to our group just so we have a voice so that the drilling and processing and production facilities that are done, that we citizens have a say in it and how it's done. It just doesn't spring up overnight. It's going to impact the quality of our, our life and it could impact it in a very, very bad way if we all don't get involved become aware and try to influence it. And the Citizens Against Oil Drilling want other residents to be cautious of leasing or selling their mineral rights to oil drilling companies. It may seem like, wow, we're going to get this extra money every month. Well, one is you may or may not get anything. And two is the extraction of that and how it's done could dramatically impact the value of your home, your neighbor's home, and the quality of our community. So again, we're not anti-drilling. We just want it to be done responsibly. And right now the laws don't account for that and it creates a great danger to our community. If you're a concerned resident and you want to find out more information about oil drilling or become a member of Citizens Against Residential Oil Drilling, log on to citizensard.org. Reporting for Shelby This Week, I'm Katie Shimatero. Shelby Township officials and residents have bought themselves more time to get state legislation involved and shut this drill down for good. Americans have an insatiable thirst for gasoline. When you look at our local roads, they're bustling with cars. Americans drive nearly three trillion miles per year. But exactly how do gas prices get established? Who decides how much we pay per gallon? Stacy Sansaterra looks for answers. Gasoline is the bloodline that keeps America moving, and tracking gas prices can feel like a roller coaster ride. They're down a little one day and shoot up the next. Plus, prices may vary depending on where you look. How is the American consumer supposed to make sense of all of this? John Nightingale owns the Marathon gas station at 23 in Van Dyke. Marathon will call me with what price they want on the sign every day. And sometimes we'll get phone calls once or twice a day either to raise it or lower it. These calls, for the most part, come at nighttime to reflect pricing for the following day. And so, how can such extreme fluctuations in price take place? That is the golden question. They say it's commodities, uh, volume based on consumption. Uh, we get increases that'll be 35 cents a gallon up one day, and two days later it'll go back down. Uh, only the oil companies would know that answer. 
And here's where it gets tricky for the owners purchasing large volumes of gasoline. When we buy fuel, like I used to buy it by the load. So if I, if I bought it on a increase and it goes down, I could lose a couple thousand dollars in three, four days just on buying it at the wrong time. So they determine when it goes up and they, de and they make the market go up and down as they see fit. And so, who is regulating the oil companies? Well, the state of Michigan is supposed to regulate the oil companies, but as you've seen in the past, they can raise it 30, 40, as high as 50 cents since I've been running this overnight and then watch it go down. And we see that on a regular basis where you'll see the market go up 35 cents and over the next four or five days it goes back down. And truth be told, there is no money to be made for an owner with gas sales alone. It's inside sales. Uh, years ago you could make some money. Today, like I said, with Marathon, they pay me three cents a gallon, well just under three cents a gallon for, for the, selling their fuel. Anyone that does the math, there's no way at three cents a gallon I can make any money selling fuel. And that's why unless you have a big convenience store that you're selling Slurpees and hot dogs and all the accessories, there is no money in gas. John Nightingale has owned this station since 1986. And even to this seasoned owner, pricing just doesn't add up. I cannot see any reasoning for 30, 40 cent increases. When we go back, I started in 86, when we used to get three tenths of a penny, eight tenths of a penny increases, that was one thing. And then it started going into three cents a gallon. We thought that was outrageous. Today, they don't have three cent increases. They have 10, 12 cents, 30 cents. Someone's, someone's making a lot of money, and I can guarantee you it ain't the dealers. So is it supply and demand, or are the oil companies just gouging us? You be the judge. Either way, we will all just continue to cringe as we pay high prices at the gas pumps. For Shelby This Week, I'm Stacy Sansaterra. I guess we'll be cringing for a while. Families, the first day of school is here. If your clan is worried, we have a few easy ways to smooth the transition. Get everything you need ready for the night before. Get the kids on a schedule. A checklist for school nights. Homework done, lunches packed, backpacks ready. Ditch the technology. Kids tend to lose track of time when they're on their smartphones. Draw up a checklist for kids to do. They'll feel the sense of independence. Next, school supplies. Notebooks, backpacks, glue sticks, pens, binders, calculators. So much to buy on a little budget. Do a scavenger hunt for things you already have. Ask friends if they have extra supplies. Student Carly Jacklin tells us she's excited about starting school. A new beginning means preparing now. Well, I just got my schedule and um, I'm kind of guessing on what I need. So I got to wait till the first day to get all my things, but I'm starting right now. Carly's mom takes advantage of local sales for back to school supplies. We're trying to get her backpacks and the little school supplies uh, together so that she can start out on a good foot. Um, it's a lot of budgeting and shopping around to try to get the best bargains, but we seem to be doing okay. We, uh, we try to repurpose everything because it's just so crazy anymore. Um, getting all the supplies together for her for the school year makes her more organized and less stressed when she goes to school and she can get through the day without any issues. That gets us through elementary education. What about college? College can be very expensive, especially with the technology needed. Here's some ideas. Apple is offering a lot of high demand products, for example, Apple sells the MacBook Air, an ultra-portable machine with an all-day battery life. Also, there's the Apple TV set-top streaming box. Another way to keep cash in your pocket? Check out these apps for budgeting. Level Money app. You can monitor your spending and keep track with the Receipt app. Hello Wallet is another app. You can sync all your accounts to the app. 
and check out the budget tracking tools. Now you have a financial tool in your pocket. Another tip for parents, meet your kid's teacher. The one-on-one -on -one relationship helps not only your young student, but communication between you and the teacher. Imagine your child has a life-threatening allergic reaction to peanut butter or a bee sting at school. As a parent, you want to have trained people standing by with the right medication. A new state law requires schools have to have EpiPans on campus, and Utica School District is on board. The increasing amount of allergies kids have have. Beaumont recently held an event for UCS teachers, teaching them how to use EpiPens. Um, well, today, uh, to kick off our school year in Utica Community Schools, uh, we are providing um, some training for principals and uh, administrative clerical staff for um, training on EpiPen uh, to make sure that both known allergy and unknown allergy students are safe and secure in all of our school buildings. Well, for those kids who start out with allergies, you know, they've been to the doctor, they may have ha already had a life-threatening reaction once, and so they have an emergency care plan that's written by their doctor and their own EpiPen supply that they come to school with. But there's those kids who may have never been stung by a bee before and they might get stung out in the playground and develop anaphylactic shock. In those cases, we have to be prepared to act. We have a strong um, relationship with Beaumont um, Hospital and Beaumont Systems. Um, we, have, we have great community um, partnerships across the board, but with Beaumont specifically, uh, we've asked them to come in and work with our teams to make sure that we're providing the best practices and best usage of um, not only EpiPens, but other medications and known uh, pieces that are of, of importance for our students. Well, I don't have the exact number, but the, it, the numbers are growing every year, and there's so many kids with severe uh, uh, reactions that can cause anaphylactic shock. It's really important that this new law has come into effect and they need to be able to know how to recognize those signs so that they can pre be prepared to act. I didn't ask where they where do they jab you? Oh, <laughs> always in, in the, always in the outer thigh because okay. it's the biggest muscle and it's easiest to absorb so once they put it in the thigh and what's great about the pens they can give it right through clothes so it's not like they have to worry about that. Uh, once they give it they massage the area for 10 seconds and and you just stay with the child and wait for 911 to come. Um, well, once the administrators are trained, uh, we have primary people that have been trained today. Uh, they bring that awareness and that um, community response on a daily basis in their buildings. But then after that, we provide, um, through principal leadership once again, further trainings of the staffs within each one of our buildings. Well, I think everybody needs to be trained on EpiPens and, and uh, they can save the life of a child. Two EpiPens will be at each Utica Community School, a good safety precaution now that teachers know how to use them and when. The wheels on the Utica School buses are ready to go round and round for the new school year. All 246 buses passed inspection before school starts September 2nd. The annual state inspection for the buses includes a checkup on all brakes, steering, and suspension. UCS buses received a 97% on their exam, and A grade earned means a good inspection. Township residents are bowling over at the Shelby Lanes Bowling Alley. Recently, Shelby Lanes held their annual Kid Registration Day. Kids could sign up for bowling leagues that will go on during the school year. At Registration Day, kids could bowl a free game of bowling for kids who signed up. Starts September 6th and it goes from 9 to 10 30 uh, every Saturday so you know it's a great way to get them here involved if you as a parent have something that you have going on in the morning and you want to get them out of your hair into ours you know we would love to have them. You can still sign up through the middle of September bowling leagues during school years after school keep kids out of trouble call or stop by Shelby Lane's phone number 586-731-4800 Address 50721 Van Dyke Avenue. Coming up, a hoopla for you, we'll tell you when it is, and can't find the peaches, we'll tell you why. Stay tuned. Take my hand and start a brand new day. Underneath everything we are, we are all people. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. A local Samaritan house is helping the community 
one hoopla at a time. Sarah Schunk explains. For the past 20 years, the Samaritan House has helped about 450 people a month to fill their pantry when times get tough. And on Saturday, September 20th, you can help them fill their pantry at the Harvest Time Hoopla. The Harvest Time Hoopla has been a traditional walk that Samaritan House has done for the last decade or so. And it's usually been held up in Romeo. And this year we decided to expand the walk site. So we're holding it at Washington Municipal Park because our service area for Samaritan House goes from 23 mile up to 32 mile road and beyond. So we're trying to incorporate more of Shelby Township and Washington Township as well as Romeo. The 1K, 5K walk is a pledge-based event, and the goal this year is to raise a whopping $12,000. That's enough to fill the pantry for one month. The event promises lots of family fun. But we're also going to have silly stops along the way, interspersed along the way. And those are everything from Boy Scout troops doing things like um, eating a donut without your hands, or having face paintings, or pumpkin bowling, just all sorts of fun family events that we can have during the walk. Along with the fun, there will be a raffle. This quilt will go home with one lucky person. Um, the quilt was made by about 14 women, a little quilting group, and they have done this for us for numerous years, and they just put their heart and soul into it, and it's obviously a beautiful piece, and it's another very popular fundraiser that we have for Samaritan House, so we will be drawing the winning ticket for the quilt on the Hoopla Day. The event will take place behind the Washington Township offices. To sign up or to donate, go to SamaritanHouseMichigan.org. For Shelby This Week, I'm Sarah Schunk. That's a beautiful quilt. All the women in the township, you're invited to step it up. The Shelby Community Foundation is sponsoring an event called Step It Up, Women Helping Women. The annual event brings women together for their women's fund. It will be held on Friday, September 26th at Cherry Creek Golf Club. 5200 Cherry Creek Drive. Doors open at 9.30 a.m. and lunch is at 11.30 a.m. Special guest speaker is Dr. Katherine Waller, an expert on women's health. RSVP by September 19th at 586-909-5305 or go to the shelbycommunityfoundation.org for more information. Arts and Apples. For 49 years, the Arts and Apples Festival has been one of the nation's top fine arts fairs with over 290 artists on display. John Martin gives us the details. At the Paint Creek Center for the Arts in downtown Rochester, we talked to festival organizers about what to expect at this year's art show. Um, this year we have over a third of our artists are brand new. They've never exhibited before at the festival, so it's very exciting for us. Um, this year we did a juried um, online process for that and we got an additional 200 applications so I think people will see a lot of variety, a lot of new faces, a lot of different work that'll be very interesting. Um, this year as far as apples go we will have Yates Cider Mill there. They were with us last year doing apple pies but this year they will be there all weekend doing cider, apples, donuts. So. That will be a huge success for us. People are always looking for apples. Um, as far as our entertainment goes, we will have our, we really try to focus on our regional acts and local, working with people who, you know, aren't huge names, but I think it's great because it adds that whole community aspect back to the, the festival. So we will have the Rochester, um, the three high schools marching bands will be back out. Um, and then we will have regional acts such as uh, Diamond Harding, it's a solo uh, singer. We had her last year, she was a huge hit. Um, as well as Hubble Street Jazz, who is one of our returning groups that comes year after year. They add a nice element to the festival. Um, and then we have our Kids Art Zone, which is our um, big pull for families. It's free, everything in it. So we ourselves, Pink Creek Center for the Arts, has an art tent where we'll be doing crafts, um, paper bag hats and paper plate masks for the kids. Um, the DIA will be there doing paper flowers. Uh, Oakland County Parks and Recreation will be out again with the inflatable bounce houses and um, the rock climbing wall. And then Meyer is our new element. They are actually sponsoring the Kids Zone this year. We're very excited. They will be there with all sorts of giveaways and prizes and things like that for the kids. So, and we also have our art maze, which is interesting. It's a large maze with um, different 
parts of paintings from history and the kids go in and they find the painting and they get a prize. So it's very cool. Our building here, we've been in this facility for 31 years and the Art and Apples um, Festival produces 70% of our annual operating revenue. So um, that consists of, uh, allows us to have 50 different art classes that we offer here in the center. Um, we have an exhibition center that we're sitting in now um, where we exhibit Michigan artists' work. And then we also have an uh, art market downstairs where we sell um, the works of uh, Michigan artists as well in our, uh, our lobby. Um, one of the additions that we're having this year is um, we're actually making some facility improvements on the exterior of the building. And so we have some um, architectural renderings that we're um, going to be showcasing at every entryway at Art and Apples this year that shows that we're generating revenue and where that revenue that, you know, you drop your $5 in that's requested um, as you enter the festival, um, that goes to support Paint Creek, not only what we do inside, but also making um, investments in the property. So we'd like to do a sculpture garden. Um, we'd like to build a parking lot right now we have uh, are completely re completely reliant on parking on street so um, we'll have some dedicated parking for the center and then um, a lot of exterior improvements including um, an exterior art installation that would change out every three months so um, that would be very exciting and create some interest in the building um, a new sign I mean a whole bunch of investments that we'll make in the exterior of the building I, I think that you know Large or small, young or you know, young or older, you're you're going to find something that appeals to everybody at the Art and Apples Festival. So we're really excited about um, this year's festival, the new artists that are coming in that will add a whole new different dynamic to the festival. Um, but there's always the folks that have been there year after year um, that continue to come back and support the festival, um, the artists, and so we're very very excited to produce this event every year. Go to artsandapples.com for detailed information on this year's artists, food booths, and entertainment. The 49th annual Arts and Apples Festival will take place September 5th through the 7th. For Shelby This Week, this has been John Martin reporting. Looks like a lot of fun activities. What was the impact of the harsh winter to our peach crop? We're beginning to find out, and it's not good. While our apples did outstanding this year, Peaches, which are most vulnerable to the cold, didn't do well at any local orchards. This comes at a terrible time since the Romeo Peach Fest utilizes Michigan peach crops. It's said that about 50% of the peach crop have been damaged. This has made local orchards and the Romeo Peach Fest officials bring in the peaches from the west side of the state. Farmers say this is all a part of farming. It's a gamble and sometimes the fruits of their labors don't pull through. And speaking of fruit, here's a slice of good news. The famous Ockett's Handmade Pie Company is expanding. The company headquarters located here in Macomb County will be adding 5,000 square feet to their facility in Chesterfield. Not only are they adding space for pies, but they're also adding jobs. The company started 21 years ago as a small pie shop in Armada and has now expanded with popularity. The expansion will include new production equipment, more workspace, and extra storage space. Sounds like a delicious move. In road construction update, Van Dyke between 25 and 26 mile roads, construction takes that road down to a one lane passing road, causing major backups in that area. Also. 25 mile road is still closed both east and westbound between Mound and Van Dyke. Try and avoid those areas, seek alternate routes as the county makes repairs and resurfaces roads. In sports news, the Utica Chieftain High School football team is starting the season off strong. You're the hammer. No. You're the hammer. Yeah. So go. You're getting kicked out. No one's coming. The Chieftains are practicing hard for their upcoming 2014-2015 football se season. Here's some more from Utica varsity coach Tony Smith. Some people are going to watch us and go, you know, they look awfully similar to a running football team, and that's kind of what we are. Um, we're going to have to obviously mix in some play action so we can take advantage of safeties and linebackers uh, pressing line of scrimmage. Um, as far as like surprises, I mean, I, I think I'm not really surprised by anything quite yet. You know, it's week one. I, you know, I'll have some better opinions after like week one or week two, and we'll have a, a better assessment of what's going on. Also, there's a new preseason look to the team. Helmets the kids designed. 
Uh, last year we did the feathers. I thought it was a great idea. Our senior class wanted the feathers, and I usually leave it up to the seniors. Um, when we had to split you, everything was great. Everyone wanted to split you. That was what defined them, and that's what they wanted. Well, when the, the Miami University of Miami said you can't use it anymore, we decided to go away from it. So then what we had to do is come up with something. The seniors last year chose the metallic feathers. Very cool decal, but it involved a lot of work putting them on. They had to take out screws. They had to cut them in some spots. So this year the guys decided to go with something plain and simple, and I'm sticking with it. So it's going to be our decal. Um, but I, I think that you know the whole thought process, and again, the kids designed it. It wasn't my design. It was their design. You can check out the new helmets and the new start of the football season. Utica hosts the Ford Falcons at Barney Swinehart Field on September 5th. And Shelby TV will be there with full coverage. Mosquitoes are testing positive for West Nile in the area. Macomb County is taking precautions after detecting West Nile virus in a sample of mosquitoes collected in the city of Fraser. The Macomb County Health Department reminds residents that during summer and fall months, mosquito-borne diseases like West Nile are a risk to the public. People need to take precautions to protect themselves from mosquito bites. Wear mosquito repellent and long pants and shirts if you're outside. This is a first positive West Nile virus sample detected this summer. Authorities say two men were boating when their vessel broke down about two miles from the brink of Niagara Falls. The 19-foot boat was anchored but was, but was about 2,000 feet inside the two and a half mile exclusion zone from the falls. Local rescuers couldn't get the boaters. The Detroit branch of the U.S. Coast Guard flew over to the Niagara River just before midnight, along with crews from Buffalo and state police. The disabled boat is still on the river. The owner of the boat is talking to a company to salvage his boat. But we're glad those two men are okay. And that's Shelby This Week. You can watch us online all the time at shelbytv.org. And remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shelbytwptv. Thanks for watching.